So we're going to go on to a slightly new topic today. We're going to be studying uh, Arbel inversion and then talking about Faraday rotation imaging. Uh, does anyone have any questions on all the inflammatory stuff we've covered so far before we leave the part? Everyone seems very happy with interferometry. All right. So, interferometry. This technique that we're going to be talking about today, Arvind inversion, is actually quite general. And I'm introducing it in the context of interferometry because um, we often use it with this technique, but it could also be used with, um, you know, admission to a plasma that we can really be on. Um, we'll talk a little bit about you know what our inversion is and what symmetry requirements we have, and you'll see quite quickly it's actually quite general and it can be used in lots of different cases here. So what we have from interferometry, which I'll just find as IF like that, is we've got some integration of any DL, right? So we have some line integrated quantity. And we might have that line integrated quantity along a very specific chord. So we might be integrating along the Z direction. And we might be at, you know, x equals x zero, y equals y zero. And we might be resolving it as a function of time. That would be our sort of temporary, temporally resolved interferometry. Or we might have an image of x and y, and we would have it at some specific time. This would be our spatially resolved interferometry. So this is what we have. And of course, what we want is what we can't have, which is the electron density as a function of position everywhere in space, preferably as a function of position in time. This is what you'd like if you want to compare it to like a simulation or a theory or something like that. And instead we have these line integrated measurements. Okay, so if you want to calculate this density from some of these limited reduced uh, data sets, you could do a technique like tomography. So if you've ever gone for an MRI or something similar, tomography, you'll know that what they do is they'll take lots and lots of different images, slowly scanning around your head or other injured part of your body, and then they'll do some very fancy computer techniques to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of whatever it is they're scanning, right? And this works extremely well because people have lifetimes of years, but plasmas only have lifetimes of you know, seconds or milliseconds or nanoseconds. And so it's very hard to just slowly rotate your plasma in place while you take lots of pictures of it. The alternative, if you want to do single shot tomography, will be to surround your plasma with lots and lots of cameras and look at it from lots of different angles. So for example, if we've got sort of a circular cross-section plasma like this, maybe this is some sort of pokemac type thing, we could just have lots of different lines of sight. And we could do our tomographic reconstruction like this. But of course, lines of sight, LOS, are expensive. So we don't tend to be able to just have a very, very large number of them. But of course, for some applications, this might be justifiable. On ETA, they've got 550 kilometry lines of sight for reconstructing the emission from it. So they made a choice to have a lot of imaging lines of sight. In general, for interferometry, this is too expensive, so we don't do it. But what we can do is a version of this where we make uh, strong arguments about the symmetry of our plasma, because if our plasma has some underlying symmetry, it helps us have need fewer lines of sight, and we can still start getting out to the approximation of the, the full density profile. And the symmetry we're going to talk about today with Arbel inversion is an assumption of cylindrical symmetry. So we're going to assume cylindrical symmetry. And so that could be, again, something like this plasma here with a circular cross section. And we're going to assume that there's, maybe there's variation in this direction out of plane. That doesn't matter. We're only trying to measure it in one plane. But we're going to assume that our electron density, any of x, y, and z, is just a function any of r and z, where r squared is equal to x squared 
plus y squared. So that's the same as saying that the density is constant on sort of nested circular surfaces. And of course, if this is something like a tokamak, that's quite nice because we know that on our flux surfaces, quantities tend to be constant. Um, and this could also be true for like a cylindrical z-pinch plasma and the sorts of experiments I do or uh, other. And you can think of other situations where you think things are approximately symmetric, right? And if you have a system like this, you could have a set of interferometers looking along parallel chords like this. Or if you aren't working with a tokamak and you can do like imaging, you could have a camera an expanded laser beam, as we discussed before, and that camera is now measuring any of, uh, let's see, x, y, t equals t zero, or these could be a series of chords which are measuring any at x equals x dot pi like that. So this is just two different ways to look at this problem. I can either build up my data from multiple time-resolved interferometers looking along parallel chords, or I could have an imaging system looking at a single time. But in both these cases, we can do this thing called the Arbel inversion. I'll just write down. Uh, oh, I did wrote it down already. Okay, good. Arbel's one of these guys who's kind of depressing when you read his biography. He was a Danish mathematician. Uh, he invented all sorts of wonderful things in mathematics as well as the Arbel transformation, and he died of consumption at the age of 26. So I don't know how many of you are still younger than 26, but you've still got maybe a couple of years to make such groundbreaking discoveries. I'm already past it. I don't have a chance. Now. So, you know, you look at his biography and you're like, damn, that was a lot of work there. <laughs> okay, cool. So what we have, say, from either of these two systems is a map of the line integrated electron density as a function of y. And I'm just going to draw this very suggestively as this sort of very blocky setup here. So each of these densities could be the density that we measured at a single pixel of our image, or it could be the density measured by our n time-resolved interferometers here. So we've got some density value at each of these points like this here. And what we want is of course our um, plasma density as a function of r, not as a function of y, which is a coordinate, for example, could be one of these two. I'm not going to distinguish between y and x here, as long as it's perpendicular in the probing direction, it doesn't really matter. But what we want is this as a function of r, and we'd like to have some nice smooth function and it doesn't necessarily have to have the same shape of this, of course, because it's kind of clear if you look at this and you think about it for a little while, that your profile in any DL doesn't have to be the same as your profile in any like this. So what we want is some mathematical formalism that allow us to take this data and produce this. It's kind of clear how to go back the other way. You can certainly do it numerically very easily. You can just sort of make this up and then you can, uh, you can make up some profile like this, and then you can just calculate the line integrated density along each line of sight. What's less clear is how to go back the other way from the data we have to the data we want. So this is the setup of the problem. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? Any questions online? So this is what we measure, and I'm going to call this some function capital F of Y, and I'm going to call this some function lowercase f of R. And the reason is because it doesn't actually matter whether this is density or brightness or whatever else, uh, the, the mathematics is all the same. So I'm just going to refer to them as these two different functions, and we're trying to convert one to the other. So mathematically, we have our line integrated function f of y, which is equal to the integral of any z like this, 
And this is equal to the integral from minus a squared minus y squared square rooted to plus a squared plus y squared like this f of r and Okay. I had it right in my notes. I decided to change it on the fly. I hate it. We're going back to the notes. Okay. And I'll draw you a diagram of the geometry here, which might be slightly different from the diagram of the geometry I had just previously here. So we have some plasma, which has a approximately circular shape it's bounded at a so we can say that the pressure at a is equal to the zero this just stops us having to integrate out to infinity which is very inconvenient when we try and do it in reality so we're going to stop our plasma at some distance as we only need to make measurements up to the boundary a in order to solve this problem we've got some cores going through the plasma we've got our coordinate system where y is transverse to the direction that we're probing, and x now is the direction that we're probing. I was using z a lot previously, but the way I've got it written is x. Stop myself getting confused if I do that. And so, for any point inside the plasma, we can say that there is some distance y that it sits at from the origin here, and some distance x along that it sits at, and so there's some distance. And this is the radial coordinate. We're assuming that we have symmetry in the azimuthal direction and in the angular direction. So we're only interested in the size of this radial coordinate here. And then if you look at this and stare at it for long enough, you can see that this is indeed the procedure I was talking about before, where you can easily go from your, if you come up with some calculated profile, uh, some guess at what you think the distribution is, like the Gaussian, how you go from that to your prediction of what you're actually going to get on your detector. So this is the easy direction. This is actually the Arbel transformation. And what we're really interested in is the inverse Arbel transform. Now, we're technically requiring this condition here. I've written as pressure, but why don't we, now that we're talking in terms of these functions, sort of uh, written that I want f of a to be equal to zero. This isn't actually quite true. The rigorous requirement is that f of r as r tends to infinity. This needs to drop off or fall faster than one over r. So you can get away with like a Gaussian type function or something like that, as long as it falls sufficiently fast. You can't get away with something that is uniform across its space. Uh, but as long as your function falls off nice and quickly, uh, you can use this technique here. Okay, so, so this is actually quite the other transformation. What we do at this point here is we realize that this is a horrific mess of R's and Y's and X's and things like that. And we decide that we want to rewrite everything. And we already said that R squared is equal to Y squared plus X squared. And so we want to have a go at substituting this X out for something that's in terms of R instead. And this gives us the real transformation, which is f of y is equal to 2 times the integral from y to a f of r, r dr, square root of r squared times y squared. And if you stare at this for long enough, you can convince yourself that doing the substitution into the integration will work out, and that we've correctly dealt with the limits here as well. And so this is the thing which is called the Hubble transform. Okay, but we, as I mentioned, don't want the Hubble transformation. That's relatively easy to do. What we have 
is f of y and we want f of r. So what we want to be able to do is the inverse. And I'm not going to derive this. Um, I'm not even sure I know how to. Um, but if you stare at the what I'm about to write down and this for long enough, you can convince yourself there is enough shared features to it that it's probably correct. And you can go look it up if you want to all the details. So this gives us that f of r is equal to minus one upon pi times the integral from r to a of df dy, that's our capital F here, dy, y squared minus r squared, or the square root of. Remember, this capital F is something we have as a function of y. So this is our line integrated measurement, and this is our uh, azimuthal symmetric rate of dependence that we measure. This is the thing that we're actually trying to get at here. Okay, so this looks like a complete solution to the problem. If I have some measurement from my detector, which is line integrated, and I have enough samples in Y, I should be able to work out what F of R is. Can anyone spot any limitations to this procedure? There are two obvious ones. It's not clear where the plasma ends all the time. You just say that again, please. Yeah, it's not it's not always clear like what A you should choose. Okay, so that's a reasonable one actually. So uh, where is A? Um, that is actually a problem. Uh, I will definitely agree it's a problem. It's less of a problem as long as A drops off rapidly enough, which is related to this. <laughs> but you're right, you know, the edge of our plasma is kind of fuzzy. Um, I mean, you know where the density definitely goes to zero if you have a vacuum chamber, right? The hard metal walls of your vacuum chamber. So maybe that would be good enough. But yeah, you certainly want to do this experiment and know where A is. Uh, other limitations, that's it. You do have derivatives, so that's going to be limited by detective resolution and then like experimental noise. Yeah, so the F dy is noisy, right? If we go back to this, very suggestive picture that I put in here deliberately like this. For any realistic system, you have discrete measurements, discrete locations, and we all know that doing derivatives of discrete data is a nightmare because you're taking something that's noisy and you're dividing it by a small number. So any noise here gets really amplified up. So this straight away looks problematic. Uh, third thing. Yes. I don't know if we want to count this, but like once you start getting close, uh, Close to the edge, and then you get that directly, it'll be able to have a much larger, very much smaller number in the bottom. Than here. Here. Close to the edge? I think that's right. Why are we closer to it? I was thinking like if you just have three. You're close. We're not quite right. Anyone else know? So, the, the, what are we talking about here? We're, we're, we're talking about the fact that. There's something interesting going on here, and your your physicist eyes have seen this and gone, aha, you know, whenever we start having numbers minus other numbers in the denominator here, there's some chance that this thing will go to zero, right? And it will actually go to zero for y close to r equals zero. So near the center here, this thing will have a singularity. Now, in reality, we won't have a singularity, right? Because we'll never have a detector bin that's exactly in that position. But what we will do is for the bins which are close to the center here will have a very small number on the bottom. And so it will amplify the value of this big number. So if this is noisy, if there's some noise near the center here, that noise will be massively amplified and will appear everywhere else in our solution. And it will cause problems with the rest of our solution. So I'll just write here that we've got a singularity. Near y equals zero. And that this amplifies the noise for these points. Okay. Any questions on any of this? Oh, yes. Why are we neglecting uh, the data where y is minus? Like you have y can only be positive in this situation, but in my moment, you can have my y being negative. It's an excellent question. And does anyone know? 
why we are neglecting the data that we have for y less than zero. We have assumed symmetry, right? In order to do this calculation, we have assumed azimuthal symmetry. And so the data must be identical for y less than zero than y greater than zero. Now, in reality, it won't be, right? We never have a system which is perfectly symmetric. So the good way to present your data is to do the Arbel inversion on one half of your data and the Arbel inversion on the other half of your data separately, and then see whether those two match. And if they match close enough with an experimental error, great, you know, like you, you've got a good inversion. If they don't match at all, then like you shouldn't have used an Arbel inversion in the first place. Your prior that you have the cylindrical symmetry is incorrect, so you can't use this method. <clears throat> So it's a good check actually on your data. The other reason is because, you know, because of this symmetry, if you're trying to save money, you might only put detectors in one half. Okay, if you're really sure that you've got symmetry, then you don't need to check. Maybe you do the experiment a few times of all your detectors spread out and then you're like, hey, this is great. Now I can get higher resolution by moving half my detectors to the first half. So, you know, there may be some reasons why you only need half the data here. But yeah, that's a really good point. Any other questions on this? Anything online? Okay, and like I said, this is very generic. Um, this could be interferometry on a tokamak. This could be interferometry on the sorts of plasmas I work with. This could be used for unfolding a mission on a NIP hotspot from an X-ray uh, image or something like that. So we're just introducing it here because it's a useful technique to be familiar. Okay, how do we actually do this in practice? Anyone think of some way to overcome at least some of these limitations, particularly this one here? So we've got again our data, which is discrete and potentially noisy. Yeah, we mentioned before this conversation. Sure. That's so that, that that could be a problem. Yeah. So you, you could you could deliberately shift your data so that y equals zero is sort of on one side of one of your bins or something like that. So you're not too close. Hard to get in practice because the plasma might move around. So you're probably not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Other ideas. I guess that also means that this idea might have issues, but if you know if you get prior information about where high gradients are going to be in your plasma, you can concentrate your measurements in those regions. That you're better resolving high gradient regions to avoid. Yeah, so certainly these high gradients are going to be dominating this integral, but of course, also the gradient, any gradients near the center is going to be dominating the integral. So you might want to put more measurements near the middle so you have higher uh, fidelity there. Other techniques. Is it possible to integrate your five parts? Therefore, you go differentiate your five if instead you differentiate the other part. I, I don't think you can do this by parts, but I haven't seen the analytical version of this, which looks like it does that, but I can't immediately check this and tell you that it doesn't. I suspect it doesn't work. Yeah. Any other ideas? You may have some reasonable idea of the distribution ahead of time and perform an expected interpolation. Okay, yeah, so maybe we've got some priors about the distribution and we fit to this, that would be good. A similar version is we could fit this noisy data with a set of basis functions that we think has the sort of information in it that describes this. And those basis functions won't have any noise and they'll be like, nice and differentiable because we'll, we'll use some nice analytical basis functions, right? So we could have like a sum of M Gaussian functions, right? Where the Gaussians have some position and sigma or and width or something like that. And then like, we know what the derivative score of those are. So, yeah. So is that, that's fitting a set of basis functions to the brightness of emissivity? Like big F or smaller? Uh, we'd, we'd still be fitting to this. This is the only thing we know. Okay. Yeah. So you, you would you would you could say f of y is equal to some weighted set of basis functions. Okay. Okay. And there are some basis functions that work really well because they've got analytical Arbel transformations. The Gaussians are one of them, unsurprisingly. But some functions have a nice analytical Arbel inversion and some don't. So you'd want to use a set of functions that have nice analytical Arbel inversions. But that works pretty well. Um, and that's what most people do. So if you go online, Python has a nice Arbel inversion package, and they've got like different basis functions, and you depending on your exact problem, 
you might want basis functions that have got more like spiky features at the edge or smooth features in the middle. And so it's just like all of these sorts of problems. There's no one size fits all. Uh, you have to sort of tailor it to what you're doing. Yeah. Did I see another question? Anyone? Can you Yeah. So uh, as always with our data, we can smooth it out, but then we lose spatial resolution. So yeah. So you know that 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 could help us, but you know at some cost. And so. You have to balance those things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my first thought, well, I can't actually think of how to do this, is the ideal would be get that derivative of animal dog to practically. Right. So the, the the idea was how to get this derivative in animal yeah. directly. I, yeah, I don't know how to do it either. Um, but I, I think this is just a fundamental limitation when you're making one of these measurements that you can't can't overcome this. Yeah. There are some really interesting links between the Arbel inversion. The radon transform, which is also used in um, tomography, and Fourier transforms. They form like some sort of weird little cycle. If you do all of them in a row, you get back to where you started. <laughs> so there's like really fun mathematics going on inside this as well, um, which I am not intelligent enough to know about. But if you like that sort of thing, you should go look on the Wikipedia page. There's a lot of good stuff. So, any other questions or thoughts on other inversion? This is just like a little aside. We're going to go on and do Faraday rotation after this. So, completely change topic. So, if you've got any more questions, speak now. So this condition of cylindrical symmetry is, is very strict. So like, for instance, if we had a highly shaped protomagnoplasm um, with divers, et cetera, it technically doesn't, I mean, it, it possesses a, a symmetry on flex surfaces, but those flex surfaces aren't cylindrical. So I, there would be no way to incorporate that information here. Yeah, so the question was, um, how do we deal with like non-circular flux surfaces, like in most modern top maps? And yes, you can no longer use an Arbel inversion in that case, but there is still sufficient symmetry, and there's a lot of symmetry. That what you would do for a tokamak is, I believe, you do a Grad Trifanov reconstruction of the flux surfaces from your magnetic diagnostics. You would then know that the density is constant along a flux surface because they are surfaces of constant pressure and there's enough motion in the toroidal direction to smooth out any density perturbations very quickly. This is roughly, obviously, there's fluctuations and stuff like that, but in general, density is constant. And then you would use that as a prior. And you wouldn't do this Arbel inversion like analytically or even semi-analytically, but you would that would feed into your tomographic reconstruction algorithm. And for any tomographic reconstruction algorithm, the more data you have, the better it is. So it's kind of obvious. And it's sort of obvious here as well. If I only have four cords of interferometry, my data is so sparse, I'm gonna have a bad Arbel inversion. And so you can have four cords of you could have your cords of interferometry crisscrossing the plasma like this, or you could still have them crossing the plasma like this. And even if your plasma was strongly shaped, so if it was, you know, some classic single null low exploit type thing like this, you could have your cords crossing in this fashion. And that would be good enough to get an inversion, uh, to be able to do some sort of inversion in the middle here. Yeah. And there's actually, I think, one of Anne White's students uh, who's about to graduate who's been working on this for x rays. And he came up with some cool ideas about, like, what if you have some sparse cords of uh, data and then in some section here you have like really really fine cords can you combine those and measure like very small turbulent fluctuations with this and apparently the answer was yes so there's there's lots of cool things you can do with model. yeah people commonly do the actual like integral formulation of the other version or is it more common to do like a matrix form of it where you, you know you know the length of your um, sideline for all of your like bins in space, and then you can you know, take the inverse of that matrix with some, you know, math massaging. I, I don't know what technique is more popular. When, when I've done this, I tended to use uh, fitting with a set of basis functions and then do the um, other inversion analytically to the fits of the basis function. But I imagine there might be good reasons for doing like a matrix formulation. Here. So, especially if you're trying to use this for like real time control. Mm -hmm. So, on um, Eta, the bolometers are going to be used for showing where the glowy bit of the plasma is, and we want that to stay in the middle. And if it starts going somewhere else, then you want to feedback on that. And so then you need to do it quickly. And so having some sort of matrix technique would be beneficial compared to like, oh, I'll carefully tune my fitting functions. You know, you don't have time to do that. Okay, any questions online? All right, let's do some fire. Are, are there ways of handling systems? Are there ways of handling systems that don't have like um, I mean, I guess you already talked about this, but like, 
are there are there ways of handling systems that like don't have any symmetry um, priors? If you d <laughs> yeah, actually, I have a grad student of mine who's been working on this recently for tomographic reconstruction. So, like, you can always do a reconstruction, but it's always poorly posed, right? I mean, you you don't have enough information to fully reconstruct the density in all points in space. Right, but like if you have some priors, you can make some guesses, even with just a single line of sight, right? You can make some guesses. And the more lines of sight you add, the more you can constrain it. And he was working on a technique, uh, which I can't remember, the acronym is ART, and I can't remember what it stands for, um, but with two orthogonal lines of sight and just a flat uniform prior. So like no information about what it looks like to start with. He was able to reconstruct some relatively complicated shapes out of this. Uh, so, you know, there are, there are some clever things that you can do. I think there's a lot of cool stuff that we can take in plasma physics from other fields. So a lot of stuff from computer vision, from tomography, from medical imaging, uh, which can be used for understanding this stuff. And people do already. So you know, there's lots of uh, nice things out there that you can do. At the end of the day, the more data you have, the easier this is. Right? So if you have very little data, you have to provide that information from somewhere else, which is like your intuition, your guesses about the plasma. So you can't win. You, know, you can't get, just get this information for free. Okay, I'm going to go on now, so we have time to cover all of this. So we're going to be looking at Faraday rotation. But we're actually just going to take a little sidetrack for maybe most of the rest of this lecture to look again at waves in magnetized plasmas, of which Faraday rotation is one use. The reason is, although you hopefully have seen some of this in earlier plasma classes, I think there are lots of different ways of looking at it. And I think the way that Hutchinson has and that I've adapted is quite a nice way of looking at it. And we're also gonna need lots of these results, not only for Faraday rotation, uh, but also for reflectometry and electron cyclotron emission. So we need to know how waves propagate in a magnetized plasma. And so we may as well just review this quickly. So if you've seen this before and you're very confident, you know, feel free to relax. And if you haven't seen it, maybe pay attention. Okay. So remember we had before some assumptions that our plasma was cold and we quantified that by saying that the thermal velocity of the electrons is much less than the speed of light. Um, we said that our frequency was high, and we quantified that by saying that our ion plasma frequency was much less than the um, uh, frequency of the waves that are sending through the plasma, and that meant that the ions effectively were stationary, so we could just neglect them and just deal with the electrons. That made life much um, uh, easier. And we also made this following restriction that k dot e was equal to zero. And this was the restriction that the waves were transverse. Now, this restriction, the final one, the transverse waves, made our life very simple algebraically. But it turns out that if you try and find the waves in a magnetized plasma while keeping this restriction, you don't get all of the waves. You, in fact, have explicitly ruled out one of the most important waves, the extraordinary mode, which is extraordinarily useful. And so we have to drop this restriction here and then deal with all the horrible consequences of that. Right, so now we have k dot e not equal to zero. And if you go back and you look through the derivation and you start rederiving bits, you end up with an equation now that looks like omega squared minus c squared is k squared. We had something like this before. But our equation previously was a scalar equation. Our equation now is going to be a matrix equation with these three by three matrices. And this is just the identity matrix. And this is my an even more odd looking object, which is KK, which is a dyad, which is also a three by three matrix here. Um, you can look up more of the details of this and how it's look. Yeah, I haven't seen it in a while. All of this is now dotted with the electric field, and that is equal to minus pi omega j over epsilon naught. Now, once again, 
he realized that j is equal to minus e n e d e. And what we want to try and do is write this entire equation in terms of e. We want to get rid of j completely. And then, of course, this is an equation that looks like a matrix times a vector equals zero. And we know how to do this. It's what we've trained our whole lives for. Uh, we take the determinant of this, we find the modes of such a That's great. So, right, we really love those sorts of equations. And so we're trying to make this equation look like one of those. So now we need an equation of motion for the E. Previously, remember, we just looked at the response of the electrons to the electric field, but now we want to have the magnetic field as well. So we have any D or B E D T is equal to minus E times the electric field plus D cross B. So this is just Lorentz force, but we've now got the magnetic field in here. And we're going to assume that our magnetic field, at least the first order, is just some static field, and we're going to point it in the z direction. Of course, I can point in any direction at once. I've chosen z in this case here. And then from this, you get out a series of equations for the velocity. And I think we've all seen this, so I'm actually not going to go through this line by line. Um, well, I might go through. Okay. I'm not going to write uh, this equation out in terms of its vector components like I have in the notes. I will make the point that, as before, we're going to say that we're going to assume that V equals V e zero exponential of I k dot x minus omega t. And that allows us to replace d dt with minus I omega. Like that. So we turn this differential equation into an algebraic equation. And then we find that the velocity of our single electron here is going to have a structure with some nice symmetry due to the magnetic field. So Vx and Vy are going to look very similar. They're going to look like minus IE over omega Me times one over one minus. Omega squared over omega squared it doesn't work so well when I said that capital omega squared over lowercase omega squared. And this is going to be equal to the electric field in the x direction minus i capital omega over lowercase omega electric field in the y direction, where we've defined here capital omega to be the cyclotron frequency EV0 over ME. For BY, we have all of these terms again, but in the brackets, we have something that looks similar but slightly different. I capital omega over lowercase omega EX plus EY. And when you look at this and you squint and you calculate DX squared plus DY squared, you find out that this is just, or when you, when, when you just look at how these work, this is of course our particles circulating around the magnetic field line. Remember the field line is going in. The z direction, and so these two components are just the spiraling dx and dy here. Yeah. And finally, we have the dz component, and that's very simple that's minus iv over omega mv dz. Okay, you've seen all this before. You can then take this. Make it into a nice vector, substitute it back into this equation for j, substitute j back into here, and you see very quickly that all you're going to have left are things like omegas and c's and k's and capital omegas and this electric field. So we're going to have some matrix equation dot e is equal to zero. And that matrix, well, we can write j is equal to minus e and e times the velocity, and we can write that in terms of some sort of conductivity tensor times the electric field, where that conductivity is this monster, I n e e squared over m e omega, 1 over 1 minus capital omega squared, lowercase omega squared, times by our nice big three by matrix, plus 
few ones down the diagonal. Prize the bottom corner here, and minus i omega over m over here. On these two off diagonal elements, then zeros elsewhere. If you're surprised at seeing something interesting involving the magnetic field show up in the ZZ component of this tensor, it's literally only there to cancel it out here. So the factor doesn't exist at all. It's just it's more convenient than writing this factor underneath all four of these terms. So you know this is just a slightly simple example. But this is the conductivity part of that. Means we can then write out in short form that omega squared minus c squared k squared times the identity matrix minus this dyad ak plus i omega over epsilon naught sigma dot e and equal to zero. And I like writing things in terms of this conductivity term, but if you like things in terms of E, I'm oh, sorry, in terms of epsilon, the dielectric tensor, you can rewrite this and you'll get Hutchinson's equation 4.1.2. Well, okay. So the magnetic field in this system breaks the symmetry, right? So we have to treat Z differently from Vx and Vy. But we don't have to treat Vx and Vy the same. We can pick our orientation of our x and y axes, make our life simple in what's going to follow. And we're going to do that now. Just got about enough space here. So we're going to have a coordinate system like this, with z pointing upwards, and that's the direction of the magnetic field. We're going to have this coordinate y and a coordinate x like this. And I'm going to choose our k vector to always be in the y to z plane with some angle of theta to the z axis here. So we're effectively choosing our coordinate system such that we can write k is equal to the size of the vector k times zero sine theta cosine theta. This makes our life much, much easier and more follows. But even if you do that, when you go to solve this equation in full generality with all these sines and cosines, it's an ungodly mess, right? So this is absolutely horrible. So you still get something terrible, which is equation 4.1.24, which I think is called the appleton hartree dispersion relationship. And it's a mess, right? So it's very, very hard to work with. And this trick is that no one actually works with it. Most of the time, we just work in the case where bigger, we have theta equal to zero or theta equal to pi upon two. And so those are the two cases that I'm gonna tell you about. When we've got waves propagating along the magnetic field, or perpendicular to the magnetic field. If you ever in the unfortunate case of having to do something in between, you'll have to go back to this equation and work it out yourself. But at least in the limiting cases, the behavior is slightly easier to understand. So those are the cases that I'm going to go through now. So that was a bit of a wish stop tour. Any questions? Everyone loves waves of magnetic plastics.
So we're going to start with the beta equals zero case. I shan't. Doesn't make sense. That was a state of equals power of two case. So this case is maybe particularly relevant if you're trying to diagnose something like Pokemac, which many of you are. So if we draw our Pokemac looking from above, we have magnetic field lines going around like this. And remember, the toroidal magnetic field on a Pokemac is very strong. And so really, although the magnetic field lines are slightly not like this. They really are very much just circles around the pocket. And where do we put our diagnostics? Well, we can't put them on the inside, usually. Um, we don't want to put them at some weird line of sight like this, because that would be integrating through things where we're not really sure about the symmetry. We're very likely to put our diagnostics like this on a line of sight, which is indeed perpendicular at 90 degrees a local magnetic field. That might be because you've got a bit through some gaps between the magnets, or simply because it's very easy. And almost every tokamak I've seen has diagnostic design to look on. This line of sight, if you have something that looks at a weird angle, that's very unusual. So it's very relevant to ask how the waves propagate in a magnetized plasma like a tokamak perpendicular to the magnetic field. And what you get are two different modes here. We have one mode, where the dispersion relationship is very familiar. N squared is equal to one minus omega P squared upon C squared. Ah, omega squared. So this is just the wave that we found in unmagnetized plasmas. What's interesting is that although we've done all of that mathematics, there is one wave which propagates perpendicular magnetic fields, which looks like the magnetic field doesn't matter at all. And so we call this wave the O mode, where O stands for order. All right. So in the ordinary mode, remember we can then go back. This is our eigenvalue. We can work out what the eigenmode is in terms of EX and EY and EZ. And we find that EX is equal to EY is equal to zero here. And so all of our electric field is in the Z direction. Just remember, we have this diagram where we have Z like this, Y like this, and X like this. I've restricted my K vector to be in the YZ plane. I have now set theta to be pi upon two. And so therefore, K is pointing in this direction which means that our electric field is pointing purely in the Z direction. And this actually gives us a hint why the O mode dispersion relationship doesn't seem to know anything about the magnetic field. And that's because the electrons are traveling along in the Z direction and the electric field as it oscillates up and down is simply accelerating or decelerating them along the magnetic field. And so it doesn't have any effect from the gyrating particle orbits. You just have particles which are going like this, and maybe they're being slightly accelerated or slightly decelerated, but it's all in the B direction, so it doesn't have an interaction with the magnetic field whatsoever. So these are nice and easy. And the nice thing about these modes, actually, is that they are transverse. So K dot E is equal to zero. So although we relax that condition, we obviously didn't need it in order to get this mode, as you can see we already got the mode before when we did have the transverse condition. So this is our nice, easy wave. The next one is not all the So the next one has a dispersion relationship that looks like this. Now, in Hutchinson's book, he rewrites several of these terms as like X and Y and things like that to make it more compact, which I think is great if you're going to write it a lot. But just in this case, I want to write it out in its full generality in terms of things like plasma frequency and stuff like that. 
so that you can see where all of those terms come from. So it's going to look a little bit more complicated than what you get in the help in this book, but I think it's more useful. So it's one minus omega p squared over omega squared. Oh, looks good, but then it's actually times one minus omega p squared over omega squared. And all of those, not the one, all the rest of these are over one minus omega p squared over omega squared minus capital omega squared over lowercase omega squared. So this is a little bit Escher-esque. There's sort of bits of the same thing repeated in a fractal pattern. And the more you stare at it, the more you think, oh, the pattern's playing at it. Oh, yeah. It seems very complicated. And remember, this is the simplified version where we've already taken plane shift as pi upon two. If you want to put in all the cosines and sines, it becomes much more complicated. So straight away, you can see that this is more than ordinary. And so this is, of course, the X mode, and it is the extraordinary. Now, you can probably guess just by looking at this, that when we substitute this back in uh, to our equation and we try and get out the eigen modes of the system, they're not going to be quite as simple as this. And you are quite right. So what we find out is that Ex over Ey, so the X and the Y components of the electric field are related to each other. And the relationship between them is minus I times one minus omega p squared over omega squared minus capital omega squared over omega squared. All of that is over omega p squared over omega squared capital omega over omega like this. Although that looks complicated, fortunately for us, the Z component of electric field is in fact zero. So that saves us a little bit of so if I plot out now y and z and x like this, and I've still got my magnetic field in this direction, and I've still got my k vector in this direction, it's still exactly the same k. Can anyone tell me what the electric field looks like here? Previously, we said the electric field was just pointed in the z direction, as it was. Um, but now it looks a little bit more complicated. Does anyone know what the electric field looks like? Yes. Um, an ellipse. So the answer was an ellipse. Yes. Do you want to be more specific? Uh, in the xy plane, mm -hmm. um, I'll be out of phase, but it looks like that. Right? Okay. So we're talking about an ellipse in the xy plane. When we have an ellipse, we have a minor axis and a major axis. So do you know where, which, uh, what is the orientation of the major axis with respect to this xy coordinate system? Mm -hmm. That's effectively asking you, is ex bigger than ey, or is ey bigger than ex? And we made some very strong assumptions in deriving this. We'll help you work that out. In particular, we assumed that this was a high frequency wave. Any answers online? you got a 50-50 chance of being right. Yeah, I hope everyone realizes that it's not going to be like wildly at some random angle. If you yeah. make the frequency really large in there, right, then the, you know, it's basically one divided by, so the, the, the uh, EX is way bigger. Right? Yeah, EX is way bigger. So if we have a high frequency, this term is going to be very, very small, which means EX is much bigger than EY, right? And so we have an ellipse that sort of is extended like this. So Ex much much bigger than Ey, and because there's this uh, i inside here, they're actually related to each other in a complex fashion. So it means the electric field vector is going to be sweeping out this ellipse as the wave propagates. Okay. Now the main thing to note here is that this wave is not transverse. So k dot e is not equal to zero because of course ky is parallel to our small but existent EY. So this is the wave we would not have got if we insisted on only looking at transverse waves, which is why you have to go back and rederive it all with this. Of course, we also put in the equation of motion uh, for particles in the magnetic field, uh, but you can see why 
it's much easier to go and drive the ordinary mode in an unmagnetized plasma than it is to get these two modes in a magnetized plasma straight away. Um, so this is a very fun way indeed. Now, there is a question in Hutchinson's book, which caused me a lot of thought as a grad student, uh, because I didn't understand what the hell he was getting at. And so I will put it to you now, and we shall see whether you can spot it straight away or not. The question in Hutchinson's book says, you have set up an interferometer looking across the plasma like this. If you have accidentally set up your interferometer to measure the X mode rather than the O mode, what would the error be in your measurements? And you give some plasma parameters so you can calculate it. So remember, in our interferometer, what we measure is not density, but we measure changes in refractive index. And so he's saying, if you set up your interferometer such that it measures this refractive index, how different would your result be than if you were measuring this refractive index? And my question I was always asking was like, how the hell do you even set it up to do one or the other? So perhaps we can work it out together. How could I get to choose whether I'm using the O mode or the X mode? Uh, well, for O mode, right, you have a Z polar coefficient, so you could polarize your um, light coming in, or? Yeah, so if I'm injecting light into my interferometer, Right, and maybe it's collected here or about it, that doesn't matter. So if I have this polarization, that's the O mode, because the polarization E is parallel to B, right? And if I have this polarization out of the page like that, that's the X mode. So you get to choose which refractive index you probe by your choice of. Um, the polarization that you're injecting. And that was the bit that I missed as a grad student that took me until I was teaching this class for the first time to finally work out what was going on, is that you actually do have a choice. It's not like the plasma decides for you, which is why I was like, what will the plasma want to do? But that doesn't <laughs> matter. In this case, in this case, you have a choice. The plasma is not in control of you. Okay. So, and in general, you could launch a wave through the plasma at some arbitrary polarization of 45 degrees. And then because you can always decompose uh, your wave into various sets of modes, but this is a good set of modes, which uh, is valid for Bay Troopers Pi upon two, then you would see that one of your polarizations would travel faster than the other polarization, right? Because it would have a different refractive index. And so you'd see all sorts of funky effects going on that may be very hard to interpret. So it's definitely worth thinking about uh, the polarization. And when I went looking recently for some papers on how people actually do this in Tokamaks, um, they spend an awful lot of time thinking about the polarization. Often they have the ability to switch it between X mode and O mode so they can do different measurements. Yes? The X mode should be polarized, so <laughs> yeah, out of the page. Yeah. Right. Yes, because you're primarily going to be exciting this large EX, mm -hmm. and the plasma will do the work of giving you the EY. And it will do that because of the uh, electrons gyrating around the field light. So you don't have to worry about it. The EY is truly fantastically small here. So it's it's okay. Like you don't have to give it that yourself, uh, which would be impossible because in free space, waves are only transverse. You can't launch a wave in free space that has a polarization along the direction of propagation. But it's okay. The plasma has got your back there. Yeah. And these are the only two waves, <laughs> the only two electromagnetic high frequency cold magnetized waves which can propagate in a plasma. So if you hit the plasma with some wave, it will instantly convert into some mixture of these two because they're the only modes which are supported by the plasma medium. So, yeah. Um, when that conversion step is happening, are we all worried about reflective power then, you know, being like a different, because um, like if, if you're injecting the wave to the plasma, that's a vacuum wave that goes slightly different from ONX, you know, I would imagine there's some chance of that vacuum wave reflecting back at you, could that, you know, hurt your uh, signal to noise ratio in some way, or is there very, a very small amount that reflects back and doesn't hurt it in the yeah. So the question is, when you have this conversion from the vacuum wave into the plasma waves, is there any power which is reflected? And the answer is, I don't know. I would imagine that there could be some power reflected at that interface there. Um, and yeah, uh, also an important thing to notice is that on a tokamak, the magnetic field stays in the same direction. 
But if you're in something like an RFP, reverse field pinch where the magnetic field rotates, your wave will convert between, you may launch an O mode in and it may convert itself to an X mode. So, and, and intermediate, you'll have all those intermediate polarizations and K vectors with respect to the magnetic field and you'll have to go back and do the Appleton Hartree formalism. And that's probably why people don't work on RFPs anymore because they're extremely difficult to work. Now, one thing I will note is you might ask, you know, Jack, you work on Z-pinches, right? And they've got strong magnetic fields, and yet you don't seem to be worried at all about the magnetic field or, or polarizing your beam or anything like that. And the reason for that is when you start looking at the frequency orderings uh, in the sorts of plasmas I work with, this term here is very, 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 very small. And so this cancels out that, and huzzah, you just have two O modes. So you're basically back to the unmagnetized plasma. So depending on your plasma regime, you may not be sensitive to the magnetic field anyway. And basically that's the requirement that the probing frequency of your wave is uh, much, much higher than the uh, gyro frequency, which is the unmagnetized condition we wrote now um, all the way back when we derived the unmagnetized waves. So you may not be sensitive to this. It just turns out in the tokamak, you tend to be in a regime where this is important. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about electron cycle transition. Okay. Any questions on this? If you noted just a minute ago, there's a number of assumptions that are drawn in Higgs derivation, chief among them being low temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, most of today's modern tokamaks operating in one to 10 KPD ion temperature. Mm -hmm. Does not seem to me like something that meets a low temperature requirement. So, what is the like? I guess that maximum signals theory yet applied to a diagnostic system, but I'm, I mean, is this valid or do we still need the thermal? Yeah, so when we say cold, we're just talking about compared to the speed of light, and that's pretty fast. Yeah. So, even when you've got like, so you can't neglect relativistic, relativistic effects completely for electrons at 10 keV, right? They've got whatever, 20%, no, some decent fraction of their rest mass at 500 K, it's not 20%, less than that. So in some cases, relativistic effects will be important and we'll come across those when we do cycle transmission. I believe that for interferometry, we don't have to worry about relativistic effects here and this holds well enough. And the corrections that you get will be on the order of the ratio between the thermal velocity and the speed of light, and that is a small number. So I think that's a really good point, but this is actually, this holds very, very well. So we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with like plasma waves, the waves inside of plasma, which are being generated where thermal effects are important, like Langmuir waves. We're dealing with these high frequency electromagnetic waves, which are traveling so fast that their phase velocity is close to the speed of light. Really, sorry, I shouldn't say C here. I mean, this is the phase velocity. It's just the phase velocity is very close to the speed of light for these electromagnetic waves. So C is, is close enough. Mm -hmm. So th this is the actual condition. For the waves inside your plasma where you deal with hot plasma effects and like Landau damping and all sorts of fun things like that, that phase velocity is much lower. And so the phase velocity is close to the thermal velocity and then you have the interaction between the wave and the distribution function of the plasma that gives you Landau damping and all the fun stuff. We're nowhere near that. That's a really good question. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, now we'll do the other case. This has nothing to do with the Faraday, but it's interesting, and we will use it twice again. So, so now we're going to do the case where the wave is propagating along the magnetic field here. Okay, so this is maybe a harder case to get inside a tokamak, but it's a very easy to case to get inside, for example, a Z-pinch or many other systems like that. So, for example, if you have a Z pinch, some wobbly plasma like this, it's got current like this, and then it's got magnetic field like this. If I fire a laser beam through this, there's going to be at least parts of the laser beam which are parallel or anti parallel, you get the same result to the magnetic field. And in fact, we'll show that. This result that we derive for theta equals zero applies to almost every angle between zero and pi over two. And the theory only breaks down very, very close to pi over two. So in fact, this still works even when, for example, here, my k is in the same direction, but my magnetic field is bent, and there's quite a large theta between them here. 
So this is a very useful thing. Okay, so we go and uh, we plug theta equals zero into the Upton Hartree relationship, and then uh, we solve the determinant and we get out our eigenvalues, our eigenvalues. And we get, first of all, well, we get two modes. And these modes, I tend to write with a plus and a minus and write the two of them together because they're very, very similar. And so this mode plus and minus, that's the names of the two modes, is equal to one minus omega p squared on omega squared over one plus and minus, this is the difference between the two, capital omega over lowercase omega. So the first thing that we notice, of course, is that for capital omega over lowercase omega, much less than one, which was our unmagnetized condition, we just reduce back to our unmagnetized dispersion relationships. But that's good. We haven't introduced everything funky in the math class. Okay. And then when we solve to get the eigenmodes, we find out that we have EX over EY is equal to plus or minus I here. Let me just draw again the geometry of the system. Z upwards, Y like this, X like this. Our magnetic field is in the Z direction. And now our K vector, theta equals zero, is also in the Z direction. And now we have EX and EY lying in the game, and EZ is equal to zero. So this is again a transverse wave. A dot equals zero. So, does anyone know what this wave is? The electric and the two components of the electric field appear to be out of phase from each other by a factor of pi upon two, plus or minus i. Circularly polarized, yes. Everyone in the room was doing this. <laughs> I, I, I guess that they wanted to say certainly part of this. Okay, so what we can do is we can say, you know, EX is going to go like exponential of I K dot X. In reality, this is just there, right? So I'm just going to set. Because we know that they are made here. Minus omega T and EY is exactly the same plus an extra factor of pi upon two inside the brackets. Like that. Okay, so if we plot either space or time, it doesn't matter. We can either fix ourselves in one place and watch a wave go by, or we can attach ourselves to the wave and see how it changes in space. We're gonna get at uh, two oscillating fields, the electric field X, Will look like this. The electric field in Y will look like. I'm very hard to draw this properly. Like that. And if you then look at what in the XY plane the electric field is doing, and you stop at this point here, and then at this point here, and then at this point here. And then at this point here and ask which direction is the electric field pointing? Well, first of all, it's going to be pointing entirely in the y direction, and then it's going to be pointing entirely in the x direction. And so we can see the electric field vector traces out a circle. And this is what we call circular polarization. And often these two waves, which I've been calling plus or minus here, we might call them the right hand and the left hand circularly polarized wave. And I can never remember the convention, but I think it's like right hand rule with a k vector. And it's like, is it going this way or is it going the other way? Like that. Um, I never really mind too much about the, which way around it is. But there is a convention about whether it's right or left. And that's what this plus and negative sign really mean here. We've got two modes, one of which is going clockwise and one which is going counterclockwise. Okay, any questions on that? We're going to use that in a moment. This is, there's not really anything particularly profound at this point, but we will get onto something profound in a moment. Any questions on that before we go?
Okay, just so I can keep that up on the board, I need to get rid of this stuff. Forget about that until we get on to reflectometry or something. Now, finally, we are fulfilling the promise at the start of the lecture, and we're going to talk about parallel notation. And the main point about parallel notation is that your magnetic fields cause a phenomena called by refringence. Has anyone come across by refringence studying optics before and can give us a concise definition? Yes, either one of you. You can sort of say it in unison. <laughs> it's object index refraction is different depending on the direction of propagation. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> is that your guess too? Yeah, my memory is that it's like that, that is a really interesting phenomena, and it definitely happened, but it's not this. Yeah. I'm not sure these words are the same thing. The angle of reflection depends on your frequency. Is that what I have to do? Okay, uh, so that was uh, the angle of reflection depends on the frequency. No, that's also not true. Yeah. But that's not a good definition of birefringence. Anyone got any thoughts about what birefringence could be related to? Anything on this board here that makes you think? Anyone online? Um, I'll give it a try. Sorry? I'll give it a try. Yeah, please. Um, birefringence is that there are different refractive indexes for different directions, uh, not different directions, different components of the uh, material. So it's like a tensor, and then the different components have different refractive indexes. Yeah, this so, is very, very close. So it's different refractive indexes for different polarizations, for different directions of the electric field. So everyone had some thought about direction in there, and that was all good. It's not to do with frequency, though, of course, this is frequency dependent. But of course, the refractive index for plasma is always frequency dependent. So that's that's not a unique thing for this solution here. The unique thing about it is that these waves have got different speeds. So the other thing, the, the, the X mode and the O mode, those are also birefringent as well. They're just not birefringent in a particularly useful way. This is birefringent in a way that we can exploit. Okay, and um, if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole of interesting stuff, there were several Viking burials where they found some of these Viking warlords buried with lumps of calcite. And people are like, why have they got calcite? It's not a particularly pretty crystal. It's kind of transparent. And you can't really make jewelry out of it. It's, it's sort of, you know, quartzy. And it wasn't carved in any case. It was just this lump of calcite. And there is a belief unproven amongst archaeologists that this calcite, which is a birefringent material, could be used to navigate on a cloudy day. So when you're sailing across the Atlantic or the North Sea to raid some poor monastery, um, and it's all cloudy, like, damn, you know, I don't know how to get to this monastery. And they didn't have compasses in those days, at least the Vikings didn't, the Chinese did. Um, the compasses, this biofringent crystal is very interesting because you might know that the light from the sun is polarized by scattering. Uh, and so, although that light isn't directly hitting your ship in the fog, some of that light is getting through. And although the fog is messing with that polarization, there's still going to be some overall polarization there. And by rotating this birefringent crystal, in the light that you're getting that's slightly polarized from the sun and looking at markings on a bit of stone, when you rotate the crystal just so, the light is gonna come through and the two markings will line up and then you'll know roughly where north is. And then you can go and sail and raid your monastery. So not saying it's true, you can go read some really cool papers on people trying to do this. Like people have tried to go out in a boat on a cloudy day and navigate <laughs> like this and it did not go well. <laughs> but you know, they didn't have as much practice as the Vikings did because we have GPS these days and so we don't worry about such things. But it's really cool. So if you like optics, go look up Viking sunstones, they call them. Yeah. I always like rings. Okay, back to plasmas. <laughs> so we said we have these two modes inside the plasma. Uh, these are the right-hand and left-hand circularly polarized modes, which I'm going to refer to as plus and minus like this. So plus is the clockwise going mode, and minus is the anti-clockwise going mode. 
if you're confused about why I'm confused about this convention, it's because like, is it clockwise as you look down the ray of light or is it clockwise as you look towards the ray of light? Those are different. And I can never remember which one the convention is for. Okay, I think it probably should be as you look down the ray of light, but who knows? And so maybe I've got this the wrong way around. If I go the wrong way around, you just swap wherever I'm looking down the ray of light or at the ray of light or wherever I'm looking down the ray of light and then I'll be right again. So it's not. Um, oh, note by the way, this does depend on the direction of the magnetic field. This is not omega squared, capital omega squared, it's just omega. So the direction of the magnetic field changes. Which of these modes propagates faster? If you're propagating along the magnetic field, one of your modes is faster than the other. If you're propagating against the magnetic field, the other mode is faster. That's very important. That's going to be what we use to measure both the magnetic field's amplitude and its direction. And we can use this neat uh, technique called Stokes vectors, uh, where a Stokes vector is uh, just a vector of EX, EY, normalized by the sum of EX squared plus EY squared. These Stokes vectors make our life very easy when we want to do the calculations. Same guy as Stokes theorem. Um, and we can say, looking at this relation between these two, that the E plus is going to have something which I'm going to call the vector R, and that's going to be 1 over I. Oh, I lied. I'm not going to normalize all of them. I can't be bothered to put a square root 2 in front of this. So just remember there should be a square root 2. Doesn't really matter. And then the left vector is going to be 1 minus I. And you can see that these have the same relationships between EX and EY. Um, and so these are the Stokes vectors for the right, right and left certain polarized light. We also can write some other polarizations in the Stokes vector notation. So if we were polarized in Pali in the X direction here, so EY equals zero, this would be the vector X, and that would be equal to one zero. And if we have X equal to zero, this would be the vector capital Y, this would be equal to zero, one, like that. Now, there are two modes inside the plasma. We could write any arbitrary polarization of our wave as a sum of these two basis vectors, effectively. And so we can switch basis vectors if we want to. So generally, when we're launching light, we don't launch it as a circular polarization. That's quite hard to come by. We launch it with some linear polarization. But this linear polarization is made up of these two circular polarizations. So for example, this X linear polarization is R plus L over two. And the Y polarization is R minus L over two. I don't know why I've got this question. Oh, well, okay, maybe it's a good point. So just to draw our geometry another time like this, we've got some k vector, which is an angle theta to the magnetic field B like that. And again, for theta equals zero, this is our dispersion relationship. I just want to point out one slightly funny, I think it's funny, thing about this. So if we have k in this direction, that means that this wave is a parallel propagation, but of course it's still a transverse wave. I think people often get this very confused because the words parallel and perpendicular and transverse and longitudinal have similar meanings. So this is a parallel and transverse wave. Okay. And there's one more word as well, which means something similar. I can't remember which one it is, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, for the R minus L over T, when is that T? Oh yeah, uh, meant to, there's meant to be an I in here, and it's meant to be in my head. Oh, yeah. Like that, yeah. or maybe minus that, but you know, you get the idea. No, it's that. Yeah. Good. Cool. Okay. It turns out, you know, we I derived this for theta equals pi over two, or I did derive it. I just showed you it for pi over two and theta equals zero, and uh, but it actually turns out that the theta equals zero case applies over a huge range of different. Uh, conditions here. So, in fact, this theta equals zero, which we call the quasi parallel case, 
it isn't good simply for theta equals zero. It's good for capital omega over omega. The secant of theta is much, much less than one. And it turns out that uh, for some reasonable values of omega here and here, this can apply for theta almost the pi upon two. So you can use this dispersion relationship, as I said up here, even for relatively large angles, the waves will propagate as if they have this dispersion relationship or at least extremely close to it. And that's very, very convenient. They, they will propagate with that dispersion relationship as long as you write your B to be the component parallel to propagation. So you replace B with B zero cosine of theta. So now the dispersion relationship here, which has capital omega in, is to do with the projection of the magnetic field along your wave. So effectively, the wave feels the components of the magnetic field in the direction it's traveling and it ignores that other component until it gets very, very close to pi upon two when the components along the direction of travel is almost zero. And then we suddenly see this pi over two uh, condition. So this is very, very useful because it means that we only need to have for some cylindrical object like this, we can use this um, uh, dispersion relationship for almost the entire region that we're probing for Faraday rotation. Okay, I'm well aware that I've gone over time. So I'm gonna leave it here and we will get on to exactly how we exploit this interesting mathematics and these scopes vectors in order to measure magnetic fields in the next lecture. So thank you very much. I'll see you, oh, not on Tuesday because you all have a student holiday. So for the people in Colombia who are unfamiliar with this idea, we have Monday off. And then to recover from the three-day weekend, <laughs> the students have a second day off for the classes. <laughs> so I will see you on Thursday.